All right. Are we good? Are we live? <laughs> All right. I'm going to assume that we are. Welcome, everybody. And as always, this is Steven Zapata. Just the best. Just the best. Anyway, thank you so much for coming and joining us today in the AIML Media Summit. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the intro to the issues. Um, I'm really excited to this panel. This is going to serve as an entry point to people who have maybe not a lot of understanding of the issues at hand or people who do, uh, but want to hear from some of our more, you know, experts, <laughs> more and more experts panelists over here. Um, I'm really, really, really excited for this panel. I have a lot of questions to throw their way and I can't wait to get started. With that said, let's not mess around and just jump straight into some quick introductions. Um, panelists are going to go around, tell them, you, you know, the audience who they are, what their expertise are. Let's start with Greg. Greg, can you mind telling the world who you are? Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Greg Rutkowski, and I'm an illustrator and concept artist. I work uh, in the game industry and uh, doing mostly digital works, but also... Uh, from time to time traditional works and i've been affected by uh ai uh, and i guess that's it <laughs> thank you so much uh keith if you don't mind going then sure uh, my name is keith kuberschmidt i am the ceo of the copyright alliance we are an organization that represents just about every organization you can think of uh that relies on copyright law copyright uh, as well as about 2 million different individual creators who rely on copyright. And we're located in Washington, D.C., and our job here, our mission, uh, is to make sure that people respect copyright and respect creators' rights. Thank you so much, Keith. Matt, do you mind coming next? Sure. Hi. My name's Matthew Cunningham. I'm a feature film and television concept artist, uh, educator, as well as a former member of the board of the Art Directors Guild, Local 800. And uh, just happy to be here. Thank you so much, Matt. And John. Hey, I'm John. I'm a senior storyboard artist at uh, Riot Games. And uh, I work in video games and animation. And I'm just concerned for the next generation of artists and um, ethics. Let's get started with the questions. I have a list of so many questions that hopefully we'll get through them all. And if not, I'm sure we'll have a great conversation either way. But before we get jumped on some of the more specifics, John, why don't you describe us, you know, briefly describe what AI, you know, or machine learning media models are? Um, just generally speaking, they're programs that rely on uh, scraping billions of uh, images and data from the internet to create uh, content and different types of media. You know, we've seen stuff like, uh, you know, uh, AI art, AI voices, and now we're starting to see, you know, AI photography and, and models. With that said, for the, you know, the next question begs, so what are just some of the con basic concerns creative have with it? John, you can answer this question, and if another, any other panelist wishes to jump in, share some of the concerns that the creative community might have with AIML media models, please jump in. Well, firstly, like, um, I just want to say that most artists have just been using the internet as a way to be visible and to gain employment, gain followers, and build reputation and, and build our brand. And we just had no idea that, you know, while we were doing this, all of our stuff was being scraped and being fed to a machine that was meant to uh, replace us while using, while training off of everything that we've done without consent and permission. And now it's bleeding into other sectors, um, is definitely um, infesting the entertainment industry a lot, but I, I predict it will go into other uh, sectors as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with with what he's saying in, in terms of what its impact could potentially be. It's something that should be isolated and studied and not simply unleashed upon uh, society or civilization without fully comprehending what its impact is going to be. Speaking, thank you. Speaking of impact, we have with our panel today, Greg Rutkowski, who, by the way, um, we've 
you know, me personally, I've been kind of keeping track about how many times is your name has been used. Um, last I checked, and these are cursory numbers, I'd love to see some more specific studies on these. But last I checked last December between more popular AI ML media generators in the image sector, such as the journey, stable diffusion, and then a more, um, you know, weird one called unstable diffusion. Greg's name has been utilized as a prompt to generate AI ML media about 400,000 times. This was that I checked last December. Greg, can you tell us a little bit about how did you find out when your work was used and how did you feel? Um, so I found out like uh, around... Uh... I was, I guess it was like uh, September 2022 when everything like just, uh, you know, blew up with the AI, with the first um, first release of, I could believe, Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion. And people were contacting me with lots of messages, lots of concerns about, you know, that my name um, uh, has been used in, uh, in those AI generators. And um, at first, I didn't know, you know, how to like, you know, how to approach, approach to that. But then uh, people were sending me links and explaining me everything because at first, like, if you're not really into this topic, it's really hard to adapt, especially with uh, in, a, in in that field. Um, and so once I get um, more infos about it, um, I started to, you know, to be more anxious about my future uh, because I've quickly realized that uh, you know my name will be used in a in not in a, in the main purpose that i use like you know designing my images and and share my portfolio things like that and uh, so people were using my name to generate some images and sign it uh with my name and that creates that created lots of confusion for me and and for many other people so i guess yeah that's the story how i learned about it thank you um so another point that we've been talking about as well is that AI ML media companies have trained and continue to train their for-profit models on copyright content. Is this something that is a concern? Whoever that was wants a question. to jump in. Okay. Yeah, that's a question. Whoever <laughs> wants to, are you guys concerned? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Definitely. Um, would anybody like to expand on this a little bit? Well, it's technically illegal what they're doing. If you look at standard copyright law as it exists presently, uh, and I'm not an attorney, so this isn't legal advice, but from my understanding, it is a violation of copyright law. Uh, it's also a form of identity theft, especially when you start getting into the weeds with people like voiceover actors who are having their entire um, their, their entire work product synthesized in a way that is blurring not only uh, the line between your output, but also your own identity. So uh, having given it a little bit of thought, my opinion is they need to hybridize copyright law with identity law and look at this as a form of identity theft and they need to prosecute it. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Right, so well, just, let's, let's, uh, that sure. This leads me to a great question. Keith, don't worry. I'm going right into you. <laughs> don't you worry. Um, I'm, I'm the lawyer on the panel here. Yeah, just... yeah, yeah. We got you. <laughs> we want to hear from you. Well, yeah. this is a great question to lead on, you know, a kind of a great segue to lead on to the following question. And if you want to address anything of what Matt said, please feel free. But what is the current status of copyright in the U.S. for AI ML media generators? How about other countries that are about like EU? Or worldwide so it depends on what kind of what question you're asking are you talking about whether if you use ai technology to create a new work is is that going to be protected by copyright and then there's also the separate issue of the training materials if you're using copyrighted works as training materials for ai can you do that without a license or do you need a license and if you don't have a license that's infringement and therefore you can be liable so let me take the second one first, which is the one that kind of Matt chimed in on a little bit about the idea that um, whether you can use somebody's copyrighted work to train your AI. And the, the first thing I want to say is there are lots and lots of cases pending here. And we're not going to talk about the details of those cases in particular because Carla's involved in one of them. Okay, yes, please don't. 
Yeah, yeah, with the <laughs> class action suit. So we're not going to talk about that. I just want to mention that there are, I, I think, about six different cases pending, one including class action that Carlo's in, and another uh, case that Getty Images has brought. Actually, they brought, brought two, one in the UK and one in the United States. But like I said, we won't, we're not going to talk about the details of those cases. But anyone who tells you that use of copyrighted works to train AI is de facto fair use or de facto allowed or not allowed, honestly, is wrong, right? But both sides are wrong here because fair use is very fact dependent. It's gonna depend on the specific facts of what type of work you're talking about and what type of AI you're talking about. So anyone who kind of says that doesn't really, really understand sort of how fair use works. Now, having said that, the AI technology companies out there will cite to a case called the Google Books case to say, yes, this is fair use. Uh, that could be, not be more wrong. That case is very, very different factually than what we have going on in the AI community. In that case, they were pulling information from books. They weren't pulling the, expre uh, the, the expressive content. And the other thing is, perhaps most importantly, is written the Google Books case, they weren't making other books out of, they were copying the books, but they weren't making a new book based on those books. And that's exactly what we have going on with generative AI, and that's why that's such a problem. Uh, and then, Carla, to your specific question about what's going on worldwide, um, I mean, the United States is somewhat unique in that we have this fair use defense that doesn't exist in other countries, right? Other countries have specific exceptions laid out, uh, per, you know, not necessarily for AI, but for other things. And really throughout the globe, countries like the United States are debating these issues just like we are today in terms of, well, what should the law be? What is the law? How does it apply? Uh, for instance, in the, in the EU and the UK, they have this limited exception for, for, for use of copyrighted works for non-commercial research purposes. And I think if we're talking about things like Midjourney and OpenAI and ChatGPT and things like that, that's not non-commercial research purposes. That's very, very different. Um, so I don't think that that would fall within the in the scope of that 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 type of exception. Um, but the last thing I'll say on this is, it's important to track not what not only what's going on in the United States but what's going on throughout the globe, because AI is a cross border issue, right? You can't really contain AI to just one country or one region. It's going to it's going to be bleed over into other countries and other regions, and so we really do have to be tracking what's going on throughout the throughout the whole world. I think on this. A great follow-up to that question for you, Keith, is are there plans in Congress or the federal government to change copyright law as it applies to AI? And what about worldwide? So basically, what are governments, you know, we've they've discussed a lot, but is there any action happening right now? If so, what do you, what are your thoughts? Well, what, what governments do best is talk, or maybe yell, <laughs> but um, and that's what's going on. There's a lot of talking going on. Uh, there's really nothing imminent. Certainly, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to narrow my comments to copyright because there's a lot of other issues in the world of AI. And But in, in the terms of copyright and AI, there are a lot of discussions going on in the United States. There's a presidential commission that's looking into a lot of different AI issues, although copyright appears not to be one of them. That group is called the NAIAC, just in case anyone's following. But more importantly, the Copyright Office itself, the U.S. Copyright Office, is going to be undergoing a study later this year. Probably, if I were to take a guess, maybe around May, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. But so, so it's kind of right around the corner. Um, and then I wouldn't be surprised to see hearings in Congress uh, to talk about these issues as well. I think that's probably on the horizon at some point uh, later this year as well. Uh, the one thing I will do, I'll do a little plug here, is that um, for anyone who's not a Copyright Alliance member, we do have these things uh, alert. And so we, we are going to be creating an AI alert. And so if you really want to stay on top of what's going on in this universe of, of AI and copyright, you can sign up for that alert. You don't need to be a member to do that. But then we also provide monthly updates uh, to anyone who is a member and a whole bunch of other things. So I just encourage anyone to visit our website and if they, if they really do, after we're all done here, want more information about copyright generally or copyright and AI. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. That was a solid plug. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very I good. Like <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. Let's take it. Let's take a little pause. We'll get back to you, Keith. But I'm, I'm also curious because AIML media models, you know, 
do affect art is but you know there's the question about how about jobs and our industry I kind of want to take it to that Matt have you seen these tools been used in your industry as a concept artist so far sure um I'm not using them simply because I kind of think of them as being unethical at this point yeah. oh okay did oh Matt. know of people who are suggesting using them as a sort of self-reflective um petri dish of their own work which i think is ethical in a way they're kind of using that technology to generate uh new versions of their own work that's something that i've seen or heard people discussing but there's, there have also been instances that i've been made aware of of productions utilizing this work illegally in a contract violation as it relates to the collective bargaining agreement laid out between the producers and the international alliance uh, so there have been things that have been going on that are not necessarily on the up and up. And I think that there's a reckoning that's going to be coming down the line uh, sooner, as soon as anybody really starts to get their head around what this is going to mean for organized labor in general. Um, now, as it relates to the film and television, it's a new technology. Uh, artists are very creative people. They want to lean into things very hard to just stay ahead of everything. But I think this is a very slippery slope and we need to be very careful about how it's utilized. In what way do you think jobs could be affected by these tools? Well, it's kind of like uh, as it relates to image generation for illustrators and feature film, you're looking at it as sort of an exponential uh, lever, if you will. So one artist would be able to output, let's say, an infinite number of images. So from a quantitative standpoint, you're going to have a lot of wallpaper. Uh, qualitatively, I haven't seen anything produced that is obviously it's not going to be particularly novel it's going to be more of a frankenstein and as far as frankenstein goes um i guess that's good enough for some people but i don't necessarily see it shaking out in the long run especially when you're dealing with a uh, very you know high caliber artists who are used to performing at such a fast rate already that generally speaking the middle or upper management has a hard time keeping up with feedback for these artists without them using a, a modifier like an artificial intelligence technology. So we're already fast enough. Um, so I think it's quality that's going to suffer ultimately if this is employed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, they say, you know, there's the idea of like quality suffering. There's also the idea that people have kind of thrown around that there's the potential for jobs to also suffer. In your opinion, what jobs do you feel are most vulnerable? Because well, I mean, as it relates to, yeah, I mean, as it relates to AI in general, anything related to logistics, anything related mm -hmm. to uh, purely quantitative elements, I think uh, writers are at risk. I think anyone who, it's it's ultimately boils down to this: if if a computer with machine learning is able to go back and scrape the output of individuals or groups, and then repackage that, that's going to impact everybody eventually. Um, attorneys for sure. Um, I think copywriters and advertising as far as writers go. Um, but more importantly, it's going to have a negative impact on aspiring artists or just human culture in general, uh, simply because if you're, imagine you're a eight year old kid right now and you're, you know, you're drawing in your free time and you, you know, as, as difficult as we all know as artists or whatever our pursuit is, it's usually quite difficult to keep up that momentum when you're constantly surrounded by even maybe you have a good support network, but the, the odds are not in your favor in terms of doing this professionally. So uh, add AI into the mix where there, I think this sort of nihilism is going to take over a lot of people's lives where they're not really certain why they should aspire to be an artist anymore. If a computer is going to generate something that would take them probably 10 years to get to from a, from just a technical level standpoint, maybe less. Um, but it can be very discouraging, and I think it's going to power wash. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, taking out the topsoil of a rainforest. It's not going to come back easily. Yeah. And we're, really... also, we're, we're also seeing, like, schools starting to implement AI as well. Like, I've heard on LinkedIn of some um, art teachers start, started to teach their kids how to do AI art, which I think is kind of ridiculous, because, I mean, what, what is there to teach, really? And also, everything is still up in the air in terms of um, legality. So, I mean, why would you be teaching um, kids how to do something that's un unethical and, you know, potentially illegal when it still hasn't been decided in courts yet? Um, yeah, that being said, like, uh, having, I think a lot of us have been getting DMs from from young art students kind of worried about, you know, what they're going to do. You know, they love art, but they're feeling very discouraged and they're 
they're not sure if there's going to be a valuable, like a, a, um, a viable art uh, career in the future. And like, I, what I say is what my art leads have been telling me is that, you know, we're still, the people who are in the position of hiring are still looking for artists right now. And they're looking for people who can take art direction and handle decisions on the fly. And maybe it won't be so much about rendering in the future. I don't know, but it's still going to be about um, drawing and communicating. So I think there's still hope for that. Speaking of which, um, John, you've discussed a lot about the erasure of marginalized communities with this technology. Can you describe this a little bit further? Well, it, it's very personal to me because I'm, uh, uh, as a you know Asian Canadian, like it's been very hard for us to kind of be visible. You know, I think we've always uh, worked behind the camera. We kind of always work behind the scenes, and you know, just you know, just to talk about the movie, um, everything, everywhere, all at once. I mean, this is the first time you know, Asian actors have been nominated for Oscars, right? And we've been we've been in the movie industry for like 50, 60 years, but you know, behind the camera. And I just feel like a lot of minorities in general are are fighting for our place to be seen in the industry. And now with generative technology like this, we're starting to see, you know, um, photography, uh, fashion shoots, um, and portraiture of minorities that aren't even there or aren't even real you know i've seen um fashion shoots of like african models where there were no african models you know and you know i've seen also uh like recently a photographer was outed as using ai imagery and like none of their photos are real but they had pictures of minorities in you know their settings and this is dangerous because now we are viewing minorities through a uh a non-minority lens and as we know, all of these um, AI imageries are are drawing from data that's already been on the internet, and the internet is heavily biased. So what we're, we're going to see is a perpetuating of stereotypes and false tropes and uh, ideologies, right? And recently, we've also seen uh, another CEO come out with um, some kind of uh, model program where you can hire a AI model to model clothing. And there, again, there were minority models in there, but they weren't even real. So now we're we're starting to see a potential job loss of uh, models, right? We're, we're starting to see um, people's uh, cultures and uh, history and 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 stories being overtaken by by um, something that's curated that that is based on biases and stereotypes. So that, that's something that's very concerning to me. When I hear this, I think a lot about, um, yes, like it's it's almost as if marginalized communities already have it hard enough to be represented in media. And now to add an extra layer where you're not even in the room, that is very concerning. But another thing that we go back on a lot is the potential job loss. Um, Matt, are the unions in particular keeping an eye out on these developments? Do they have any official positions? Any any thoughts on where union um, is at right now? I can't speak for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees or IATSE. I know that rolls off the tongue because I'm I'm no longer a, an elected official with them. Um, but that being said, within the membership, because it is a uh, is a collective group and we are all discussing it pretty fervently and it's a it's a very um it's a very hot topic i guess you could say so i would imagine that it's only going to become more and more and more evident i think presently there's a lot of negotiations uh we're leading into the negotiation rounds with uh i believe the wga or the writers guild is going to be entering in in about i think the 20th or so they're supposed to start um, so I think that's really going to be sort of what they're focused on right now, um, at least from, you know, the IA standpoint, simply because that's a very uh, important uh, moment in time, really, to kind of pay attention to which way the pendulum swings, because the generally speaking, the way that the uh, bargaining agreements work is that whoever's the lead sort of sets the tone for the rest of the unions that uh, successively bargain with the employer. So, um Long story short, I would say I would definitely expect there to be some form of statement or action uh, because I think it, in organized labor's um, interest, this is a tremendous opportunity to organize the entire planet. 
into labor unions. <laughs> and if they don't take this one, I don't think they're going to get a better one. Yeah. Well, I, I have to follow up on that because that's just such a such a good. So so in your opinion, what could unions or guilds do to best advocate for their creative workforce? Um, once again, I'm, I'm not speaking for uh, any this is organized just you. Group. This is just Matt. <laughs> just want to put that out there. It's just, but um, um, yeah, I was going to say that ultimately they already have a standing contract with the employer. So let's presume it's a covered job, meaning it's uh, part of a union contract. The union could internally just create a policy that says if this company, if this production company at any point in R&D, pre-production, post-production engages any type of artificial intelligence product, we're going to consider our contract null and void and we're going to break and strike or we'll nullify the contract or it will be a grievance or it will be something, there will be some sort of actionable um, outcome as a result of that. Now, there are already a lot of runaway productions and um, as one of our guests already mentioned that it's, there's two arguments really. One is it should be completely contained like a uh, nuclear arms treaty. The second argument is, well, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, toothpaste in the, you know, the tooth, and I'm sorry, the toothpaste in the tube. Um, but I, you know, I, my, my point of view is, uh, it is very dangerous. It's, it's almost like an invasive species. You know how everybody's th you're thinking, oh, we should bring this special bug over from, you know, Southeast Asia because it's going to be good for this plant. And then lo and behold, it's, uh, it changes the entire ecosystem or something like kudzu and how it just grows on everything. And it, it, it's a totally foreign element that really needs to be understood in terms of what its ramifications or scope are going to be uh, before it's just implemented willy-nilly simply because we have the technology. Thank you for that um, candid answer. Um, it makes me curious to hear similar thoughts from the panelists. So what are, in your opinion, good solutions to the current issues we see so far? Anybody feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in just to add to what Matt just said, and especially what he said at the end there was, was spot on, right? I mean, it's just things in the AI universe are moving so quickly, almost with disregard for, obviously there are copyright issues, but there's so many other ethical issues and and I think you know we have a, seem to have a problem with respecting people's rights and interests and and just doing you know people doing what they think you know should should be done here should be done and that certainly is true in the AI instance as well. But to your specific question about um, about what can guilds and unions and things like that, I, I want to bring up an example that the Authors Guild recently announced that they're coming out with this model clause. So they represent authors, right? And they're coming up with this model clause that their authors can put into their contracts or licenses to prohibit text and data mining and training um, that they would put into their contracts. And so groups like the Authors Guild, they can do something similar, you know, come up with like sample, sample language that you can put on your website or other things that you can do or put in your contracts. And th there, there are a host of things that you can do whether they'll be effective remains to be seen. The most effective solution here is for the AI technology companies to frankly slow down and look around the room and say, well, wait a minute, we need to do this the right way. We need to respect people's rights. We need to get their consent and we need to pay them. And then there'll be instances where people don't wanna be paid because they don't want their works used and they need to respect that just like they will somebody who's fine with their work being used. But these is a lot of different, different, different type of examples out there. Anyone else want to add on to that? That was excellent. So what else? I'm learning a lot. I just think that's a great idea. And I and I hope that there's a, a clause that can be released for artists to include in all of our contracts. And you know, we all just find a way to unite and you know uh, implement that clause into our contracts all at the same time. But uh, my, my concern is like, what, what happens if companies start, you know, outsourcing to, um, you know, countries where labor is cheaper and, you know, they don't need to worry about contract clauses or they start employing people who are non-union? Like, what, what is your, like, what would you suggest for that, uh, Keith? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to be careful not to ru run afoul of any antitrust laws by recommending everyone, to, you know, particular groups do do something. But I, I will say that 
in determining whether something is a fair use or not, in other words, whether you need a, someone, an AI company needs a license or not, um, one of the factors will be, the, is, it, is, is not taking out a license, will that harm the market, right? And, and I think we all on this Zoom all believe absolutely yes, right? But you have to influence a court, right? And, and, and others that that's correct. And if all the artists out there have a provision in their contract or do have a license, an AI license, or if they don't want a license, they make it clear that they don't want a license, that makes that fair use analysis, which is called the fourth factor, very difficult for the other side, for the AI companies to prevail on, right? And so that in order, so, so in other words, it wouldn't be allowable to just take somebody's work. But part of that, as, as, as John, you just mentioned, is making sure people do have provisions in their licenses uh, that make it clear that, that, you know, that where they're agreeable to it, that they do offer a specific AI license. And if somebody wants to use it for AI, their work for AI purposes to train AI, then they need to take a license out. Um, I think that's very, very important. And we're at the beginning of this process. Ultimately, I, I, think, I think artists need to sort of learn this very quickly. And, and AI technologies are scraping the internet. There's other things, technologies that can be used to prevent an AI uh, technology from scraping the internet or scraping your particular website. And, uh, and so I think we just need to educate artists and authors and creators of all types. Can I can I ask one more question? Actually, um, I just want to know, like, in your opinion, do you think these clauses will help protect uh, work for hire contracts, or work for hire contractors rather? Uh, so I, I I mean on the work made for hire issue, ultimately it depends. I'm not exactly sure I follow your 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 question there because we're talking about AI, and I'm not sure how AI fits into the work made for hire situation. Sure. Um, they basically, you know, in comics, for example, that's a huge industry that that is kind of um, relying heavily on the work for hire uh, contract, which basically means that, you know, everything you do is owned by that company. And, you know, you don't have any say or royalties like they own everything 100 percent. So let's say if I if I signed a work for hire clause for a combo company and I said, oh, um, like I, I implemented my own clause thing and they're saying that I, at no point should any of my art be used for AI, so and so. But, but let's say the character was Batman that I drew for, right? And then you know, DC would own Batman, but let's say they still want to use um, Batman, all forms of Batman content for AI training. Would my clause be able to prevent my own work from being scraped? Or is it that the, when someone owns that, uh, the rights for their intellectual property, does that overtake the clause? Yeah, if, 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 so that's a, well, we could spend like an hour answering that question. I'm happy to talk you offline too. There's a lot, a lot I could talk about there, but in a work made for hire agreement, if, if a work is a work made for hire, then the person who actually created the work is not considered to be the author or the owner. It's the, 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 the company, if you will, right. that made the work made for hire. And therefore they are going to have the rights. They're going to be able to control how that specific work is used. Now you as the creator, when you first, sign your employment agreement or whatever, you might be able to put certain terms in your agreement, depending on your, 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 your negotiating power, if you will, right? If you're just out of college and you're starting, you're not going to yeah. have much negotiating power. If you've been doing this for a while and you're in demand, obviously you've got more, more leverage there, right? And you're going to be able to say, look, I don't want this, my, my work's used in AI, uh, and I demand that to be the case. You know, that, that kind of thing you'll be able to put it. But that really has more to do with kind of licensing and negotiations and things like that and, and really doesn't impact sort of AI, if you will. But I but I see what you're I see what you're saying here. Okay. I because you know there were a few key key words that were said and um yeah. and there's been a discussion of what alternative ethical AI ML media models look like. And those are those that are trained exclusively on pl public domain content only. And any expansion upon that to be done via, as you mentioned earlier, Keith, licensing. So I have a question. What can creators do through licensing and technology to protect themselves and their rights? So I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit and talked a little bit about this, but first of all, 
we all know that these AI technologies scrape the internet. So if you can get away with it, now this, I know you're laughing at me now, right? But don't post your work online. Don't post it on the internet. That's easier said than done, right? <laughs> Especially if you're, you're licensing or selling your work to someone else, right? So, but I put it out there as if that's a possibility, certainly that's something you want to consider. Another thing, which I mentioned before, there are things that you can put on the web page itself to prevent or disable web crawling or scraping of images and information and content that's on a website, okay? Um, and, and, there's, I, I, and I can't talk about them here, it's too detailed, but you, you know, learn more about those, find about those and put, embed those on your webpage if you do not want your webpage scraped. You could also put a watermark on, your, on any works that appear online. That also may not be a possibility, but if you put a watermark on there, that's, uh, very, that's a very big issue in the Getty case. I mentioned the Getty Images has brought a case because their watermark is being used on images that are just, frankly, somebody called it Frankenstein before deranged. Um, so in terms of technology, those are some of the things that you can do. Obviously, there's, there's other things that you can do as well. Um, in terms of licensing, I mean, the most important thing you can do is have a provision in your license if you own your works. To put a provision in your license that says whether somebody could use the work for AI purposes or not, or have a specific AI license if that's if that's the case. And if you're putting things up on a website, put those terms on the terms and conditions that appear on the website too. Um, uh, that I think is is would also be helpful. And like I said, if I think we're all just trying to get an idea of how to address this very very significant issue uh, going forward as we get more we get more intelligent i think we'll have other ideas too but those are the ones that i think initially come to mind this might be a bit of a premature oh john did you want to say something or did you want to yeah i just wanted to touch on one more thing like i think the question was you know how can we um like protect ourselves against all this right um i just wanted to say that uh i think something that's very underrated is public knowledge and public concern you know like as you guys have known, like I, I've been blabbing my mouth on the internet for for months now, but um, I think I think it's important that you know the younger generation um, is well educated on everything that we know. You know, like we need to have um, a website with a list of resources that everyone can go back to because, you know, a lot of the time when when we're talk uh, when we're educating people, they have to re-educate their friends and re-educate their family, and they need resources that are very easy to pinpoint to to you know share share all of the jargon, share all the lingo, and share all everything that we've learned about copyright laws and fair use and whatnot um and i and i think that if all of us are vocal on twitter and instagram and you know we're, we remain somewhat unemotional about it and just very, very objective and factual but that's the best way to spread um, education and this is what i've seen um recently i mean there was i'm not going to name names but there was a youtube video that came out recently that was very controversial that was using a very famous animation to uh, scrape from right and the initial gut reaction of the art community was, you know, we were very angry and passionate, right? At least rightly so. Um, but I think once we started calming down, we we started to see one member of this group um, communicating with us and wanting to learn more. Um, now, this is very early, um, early days, but I think if we are to uh, objectively and calmly reach across the aisle and start sharing our ethical concerns, and you know, make people aware of how this is going to affect other sectors, other industries, and the world. People will start understanding that you know, simply making a fun video that's scraping off of an animation isn't simply just a fun video scraping off an animation. It's, it's so much more, and the implications are huge. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree with John Moore, right? I mean, and we talk about, or I let off talking about the need to respect people's rights, creators' rights, and and AI. They need to do that, and I think creators need to do that too, right? To understand that there's all sorts of different people. There are going to be people, artists too, right? That use AI to create new works. We have to respect that. I think this is about, like I said, it's about things like respect and understanding and education to make sure that there are people who think differently and we need to respect all people's views going forward. At the same time, like right now, the way things are being done, at least in my opinion, these training materials, these, these copyrighted works are used as training materials without that respect, right? Without taking into consider the artist's rights. And that's a real problem, right? And that, that, that's a real problem. 
But I think when, to John's point, when you go into, when anyone goes into these discussions and gets active on social media, just kind of respecting the fact that there are artists out there that use AI. There are different organizations that you have. And there's nothing inherent, at least in my view, people might agree or disagree, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, okay? Uh, what is wrong is using, a, using it in a way that doesn't respect create other creators' rights and, and, and things like that. And that's where we have an issue. I also want to say that um, I think in general, we need to hold CEOs and these companies responsible you know like they i think they kind of knew what they were doing when they released this technology into the wild you know people are going to do what we do and we're, we're curious by nature and we're going to explore whatever uh whatever is available to us uh, sometimes in unethical ways right and i think that if, if we're constantly fighting amongst ourselves we're not really going to be changing what's happening with the ceos and founders of these companies like they need to be held responsible they need to we need, people need to be made aware that what is happening right now is that these companies are trying to normalize uh, data theft and, and data exploitation, artist exploitation. They're trying to leverage it and normalize it to, to a point where everyone is using it, including your grandma, and that when we, when we finally get to the courts and are trying to you know, uh, create legislation or regulations that people are so um, intertwined with the technology that they don't want to lose it just like your phone right and i think we've seen you know after the losses have been announced we've seen a huge push in terms of marketing you know like i know like i talk about ai a lot so i'm also getting that algorithm of the ai coming back to me but in general a lot of people who aren't even talking about ai have told me like you know what i'm i'm getting like all kinds of ai ads for things that i've never even needed before and that is a marketing push to normalize um normalize what is happening right now and i just I hope people are aware of that. It's not an accident. This is this is what they're doing to combat um, the talks of lawsuits and legislations. It's normalization. Yeah. As uh, I can't comment too much on that, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, all of this makes me think. You know, you know, when we go, you know, when we talk about these things, go back to the human experience. And, you know, Greg, as someone who's been, again, as mentioned previously, so uniquely into all, in, in all, unwillingly into all of this, um, what would you like people to know about your experience? Um, it's hard to tell, like, because it's so confusing for me still. Like, uh, we've talked about, you know, different issues uh, around AI. And what I've experienced through the past like few months is uh, is a definitely confusion in and you know in different ways like in many different ways like for instance like people can confuse your work with the work of generated uh, by AI can confuse your name with uh, someone else's name uh, you know that pretending to be you it's so easy today like I had like three at least three cases where people like pretended to be me and you know they you know, uploaded images on Discord channels or something like that. And it's so easy to pretend or to violate any law today. And it's, it's, it's so weird for me that we have to sort of like uh, justify or, or just to prove that we are, you know, who we are and that this work is mine. You know that, uh, and this the same thing goes for any regulation, any sort of solution that we trying to find today, is that we trying to patch a hole in nuclear nuclear reactor right now because we, I believe everyone knows that we should go to the source, you know, to those AI developers that are not really respecting any law, any ethical law, or you know, um, and I think we should. Uh, you know, that, that's the easiest way to sort of like find find a solution. And I guess, you know, my experience is a, one of the most exaggerated example of how we can feel uh, being affected by AI, you know, that your career is like, you know, you're like 15 years of work or hard labor is like nothing because anyone can just kind of like, you know, create something in your style just within like a second. And, and without any responsibility you know and i think uh, people should be aware of that but most of the people right now find it really easy to use really easy way to express yourself you know and 
and par partially you know websites like kickstarter or any other other website that allows you to publish your you know cr uh, created product by ai uh, sort of like uh, you know adds a, a really negative you know uh, factor to the to the whole case because they sort of like allow people to use that to monetize it monetize it and i believe like this is something that hurts hurts people like me for instance because someone can use your name, can use your works in a in this AI generators, and then profit from it without without any responsibility. And then we have to find a solution to prevent you know that. And that's what's weird for me. Like it's, it's a like a classic example. Like someone can call you an elephant. Like prove that you're not an elephant. You know, it's like that's not my case you know i shouldn't be doing that and and i guess uh i find myself in the middle of that like uh probably like there are like a couple of other people that are probably um similar used as me like when it comes to the uh you know numbers but mm -hmm. i believe uh you know this is really wide topic and it's i don't know like it's yeah, I'm just confused. Like, let's say I'm <laughs> just confused about it. Yeah. I have yeah. a I have a curious question. If you were in the room with the same people who created these tools and you could talk to them, what would you say to them? Um, I would ask definitely about their ethical system. Like, you know, because I think uh, I would... I would try to visualize this, the whole case on some simple examples, like... Uh, because right now I think it's uh, technology is one thing, you know, like I know that th this will progress and we can't do really much about it, but definitely like the, the whole ethical and legal um, aspect of it should be regulated and should be rebuilt, let's say, because I think like it's obvious that those databases should be rebuilt, like destroyed and entirely built from the scratch with using like public domain uh, images or any kind of safe for work uh, images, at least for AI art, uh, because the same thing goes for ChatGPT or any other, uh, you know, AI. Uh, but definitely we, we witnessed something that is, um, is really unique to our times. Like we, we as a society, we kind of like devaluate the ethical system because we kind of we have we want to get to the we reach the goal as soon as possible with the you know least costs. And the AI is a perfect example of that. Like people likes to generate something because they express themselves, but you know, along the way they violate lots of different uh loss and and it, you know creates different issues and i guess i would try to explain them that you know this is this this should be rebuilt this should be built uh entirely in, in a different way thank you um i know that was a fun question and if anybody wants to jump in and quickly give their answer before i hop on to to my following question to greg <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to touch on something that, that I, I think is kind of interesting that, um, you know, when voice actors have started voicing their opinions on what was happening with, you know, people stealing their, their voices, uh, uh, I think more, more people for some reason understood that than when artists were complaining, you know, and that to me was just jarring, right? Like people don't realize that our art is our voice, you know, voice actors use their voice to create art. We, we draw to, to, you know, create our voice, right? It's, it's, it's something that people don't really understand. And I would also argue that artist style is identity theft. You know what I mean? It's not just stealing someone's style. You are stealing Greg Rakowski. You know what I mean? You are stealing Sam Yang. Like, um, if you don't have Greg and Sam soul in, in these generators, you don't have a viable product. You know, like, I have nothing wrong with um, AI inherently, you know, if you wanted to use public domain images or your own photographs or your own drawings in a closed data, uh, data set, totally fine. Knock yourself out. But if you, if you are expressing yourself using other people's voices and identities, then you need to sit down and really think about who you are as a person 
because you are not expressing yourself. You are expressing Greg, Sam, and every other artist uh, with with keywords that you like. You know what I mean? It's it's not it's not something as trivial as just stealing someone's style. It's everyone's style is their identity, and they use their identity to set themselves apart from um, every other artist, right? Like your 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 personality or identity is what makes you an individual, and it what it's what makes you marketable in the industry as someone unique, right? It's like why why does Marvel want to go to Greg? Why does Marvel want to go to Matt? Right? It's 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 a very specific thing. So so I just and rant. <laughs> just no no no. I want to do a quick little note on that. Um, that when yeah, like the would love to see something made out of public domain only, and then you can work on your own pictures because that's what you have right now. The fine tuning aspects of things it's still built upon data sets that contain everyone else's work so that's that's still in my you know perspective not not great but but yeah thank so you Car yeah so carl if i could add to that too i mean yes we please. talked a lot about using these works for uh, for training materials and you just mentioned you know potentially public domain materials but what greg raises is a sort of a complementary issue which is why do these AI technologies allow somebody to insert a prompt that says, give me this, that, and the other thing in Greg's style or Sam's style or, or whatever? What, why don't they have safeguards that prevent that from happening, right? Um, in respect for the, for the artist and, and as John mentioned, all, the, all, the, all their hard work and effort and years and emotion. And, uh, and I, I think by not doing that, by not taking those safeguards, we really run the risk of, I mean, we talked a lot about jobs, but we really run the risk of destroying our culture, right? Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a significant concern. I mean, we, we've been seen instances of like, you know, some companies saying that they're removing artist names and whatnot from, from these data sets, but they're also um, talking about how, uh, telling people how to make models, like to say, like, oh, you know, we'll take the name out of this, but this is how you make the model of this person, just saying, you know? And, and that to me, like, it, it tells you that what they know, they know what they're doing is wrong, but they're still going to find ways to help people to, you know, go around, um, circumvent so that they can avoid responsibility and put the responsibility on the users, right? And uh, we've also seen, you know, in, in Mid Journeys Clause that, that they have a little section in there that's kind of putting the onus and the responsibility of copyright infringement on the users, right? But not a lot of users know about this. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's that, that resource is on the internet. You can find it if you want. It's it's pretty jarring once you see it. So this is this is upsetting because it will pass by like that, and I just want to keep on asking all of y'all's questions. So let's just end it with one overarching question for the entire panel. What do you think would be a great outcome? Like, what would be a good outcome for all of us for creatives? when it comes to or concerns these tools? Like, how do you envision something that is fair and ethical? And how do you envision something that would be good for, or if, if not fair and ethical, what would be the best case scenario here for artists and creatives? And that's open to everybody. Let's let's end it on a hopeful. <laughs> I'll, I'll just quickly say, uh, I'll, like best case scenario, algorithmic uh, disgorgement, first of all. Um, you know, starting starting the slates. Uh, Describe clean. that really quick. Oh, sorry, you were just okay. about to. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, basically algorithmic disgorgement. Um, I think the FTC uh, utilized it for another case. Uh, I, I don't know the specifics again, but ever album. Yeah, right. Uh, basically, what it means is destroying the data sets and starting fresh, like restarting the whole thing over again. And I think you know, right now we've seen the potential of technology and the power of it. Now we can rein it in and make sure that it's fair for everyone. And I think in, in the best best case scenario is that artists and you know AI prompters can create art harmoniously without um, stepping on each other's feet or or robbing from each other. Right? That that would be ideal. But we need to restart everything from scratch. Yeah, I would like to add a, one thing. Like uh, if you know if data sets wouldn't have the you know artist names we wouldn't get the stylized images and it wouldn't be a, such a such a you know threat for for the artist industry if this would be fed by the photographs for instance we would have the 
you know, results generated by photographs. So the results will be like really similar to photographs and it, would, it wouldn't be a, a threat for us. You know, it would be more considered as a, as a photograph or generated image. And I think that's, that's the, you know, main issue, like just, just exclude living artists and best, best solution would be to exclude, you know, every artist, because that, that's the, the whole another topic with the confusion, like whether, whether someone will confuse original Leonardo da Vinci with fake Leonardo da Vinci generated in AI, AI generator. Yeah, I, I would add the sort of the theme that I've been saying the whole time, which is respect for creators' rights. That's what this all comes down to, I think. Uh, and um, we need to stop prioritizing technology companies and certainly non-humans <laughs> over humans. Um, so that, that's kind of the theme, I think, going forward in every aspect. I guess one more thing I want to add is that, you know, I think when we're in a culture where we're constantly consuming media and content, we dehumanize, right? Whenever we're on Instagram and we're looking at a piece of art, you know, it's very easy to be like, oh, that's cool. I don't like that. That's kind of cool. I like that. But what you're not seeing is there's a person that spent maybe 20 hours on that. You know, there's a person that put in a lot of their experiences, a lot of their emotions and tastes into this, right? And if we constantly boil people down to what they create, we're just going to continue in a world where we're constantly putting everything else above real people, you know, products, content, media, right? It's, we're at a point right now where media and content is just as disposable as people. And we need to rein that back in and remember that there are people behind uh, everything that's being created right now. Matt, final words? Yeah, I would just say everything needs to be regulated globally. Uh, it's essentially a fraudulent counterfeit market that's masquerading as something else. It's essentially just a counterfeit market. It needs to be treated like every other counterfeit market is treated. Spicy, love it. All right. Well, I think, oh, we, we have two minutes. Look at us. We wrapped it up nice and nice. <laughs> so I guess like, I don't know. <laughs> got any more thoughts or anything of that nature just there we could we could actually there's one last thing so we ended up in a happy fun note oh we can shut it down early i was gonna ask more stuff you give me five minutes and i just keep on asking oh i can go for it great <laughs> so this this is exciting to me let's end it on just like we've envisioned what a great future looks like um, what would be great words for someone who says, I want to be a part of this vision? How can they get involved outside of attending this entire AIML Media Summit? Hey, <laughs> and plug, plug quickly, go. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say like grassroots would be to reach out to politicians, you know, talk to uh, local reporters. You know, people are very interested in hearing what other people have to say, like artists and non-artists alike. And keep talking to your friends about this. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna find a way to put all the razors up there, and, and and I hope that everyone can stay educated, stay informed, and stay vocal, but stay respectful. Any anybody else before we call it call it a day? I think let's get that boilerplate language that everybody can start putting in their contracts, and let's let you know spread that globally. That's wonderful. All right, all right. Well. With that said, thank you all so much. Thank you, Greg, Keith, John, and Matt so much for your time. It was a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it immensely. And I'm sure the audience as well. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank Bye -bye. you.